Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. Hello. Well, this is the last Start the Week before we break for the summer. During the series, we've talked about British conservatism and socialism, about British history and landscape. And now, with what's supposed to be a celebratory summer underway, we're concluding by trying to take the temperature of this feverish nation. Robert Cheshire returned 25 years ago from Washington, where he was the Observer's Man, and wrote an account of what he found in Margaret Thatcher's Britain, Return of the Native Reporter. Now he has revisited it and asked how much we've changed since then. Well, not nearly enough, Elizabeth Truss, the Conservative MP, would probably say. She's one of a group of Tory MPs taking on the idea of inevitable decline in a book, Britannia Unchained. Sir Christopher Mayer, formerly our man in Washington, has made a television series looking at networks of power around the world, lots of different cities, including in London. And Majid Nawaz, brought up fleeing racist thugs in Essex, spent many years as an Islamist, jailed in Egypt, and now campaigns against extremism. Has a very different perspective, I suspect, on what Britishness means or should mean today. Majid, let's start um, with a little bit of biography. You, you, you open your book, Radical, um, with a pretty terrifying account of what it was like to be um, a relatively rare brown face in your part of Essex. Indeed. Of, of course, in those days, um, uh, people that were following uh, the, the situation with racism would be aware uh, that we experienced white flight. People that fled from East London to get away with Im <clears throat> from immigration came to Essex. And, of course, they found me there. Um, so so uh, one of the ways I describe racism in my book is to say that it's difficult to understand when you look at people, mm -hmm. you don't see your own skin colour, you see the face uh, ahead of you. Uh, but racists will uh, forever see you as a moving target because of course you can't shed the colour of your skin. Uh, so we'd be walking around randomly in the streets of Essex and without warning uh, would be surprise attacked by groups of uh, burly men in their 20s. I would be 15, 13, 14 years old at the time and they would jump out of the back of white vans uh, with uh, big knives, hammers and screwdrivers and literally just plough into us mm. uh, without warning. And so uh, on many occasions, as a teenager, I had to watch many of my friends stabbed before my eyes. And on one occasion, one of my white friends, because he was deemed a blood traitor for having associated mm. with me. Stepped in between you. He did, he did. I say terrible. friend. I mean, I've yeah, never met him yeah. since. I've never met him before. In fact, he was, so he was walking past. He decided to try and defend me. Um, and, uh, and he was stabbed as a result. And I was forced to watch. And the first um, way that you established a sort of solidarity, a larger group that worked, was through music, really? Indeed. We, we, as a result of feeling disenfranchised and disconnected from society, we, uh, we fled towards a subculture. Hip-hop was, uh, was, was growing, it was new, it was exciting. Uh, we became what we called B-boys. Uh, we, we dressed in a certain way, we walked even in a certain way. Mm. We got into graffiti and dance, uh, break, break dancing. Um, and emceeing live on stage. And it was the early heydays of hip-hop when, when the messages were very political as well. Uh, groups like Public Enemy that, that, that released an album called Fight the Power. Um, and hip-hop was, uh, it, though nowadays we look at it as gangster rap and all about sort of women and drugs, in those days it was more about, well, I suppose it still is, but especially in those days it was more about identity and finding an identity through music. So why did you move from that to Islamism, which is the next phase of the story? Right, so... Of course, Bosnia was unfolding before our eyes in Europe. And there in Bosnia, um, I saw white, blonde hair, blue-eyed Muslims who were being targeted uh, because of their, apparently because of their faith. Up until Bosnia, I'd associated all of my troubles with racism. Uh, but then, of course, I had to rethink when I saw what was happening. I should explain, you were from a Muslim family, your father pretty religiously conservative, small c, your mother more liberal, so you'd seen yeah. both sides. Yeah, conservative in a traditional Pakistani way, which was pluralistic, but nevertheless with conservative family values, whereas my mother was, as you said, liberal. Um, and when we saw what happened in Bosnia, we were forced to rethink and, and ask the questions, is this just a race issue or is it something deeper? Is there an issue with Islam itself? Now, of course, into that scene jumped groups, Islamist groups, who had deliberately politicised the religion. And as hip-hop became an identity tag um, for these groups, the religion became something of a political revolution and a new identity. And, and recruiters came along and exploited our grievances, exploited the fact that we did have real problems and, and managed to recruit us and, and, and bring this group, Hibs Ut Tahir. 
Hezbo Tahrir is an organization, it's a global organization founded in 53 in Jerusalem. And their, and their basic purpose is, as they state, to overthrow every single Arab and Muslim majority regime, uh, to replace them with one global super state that they call a caliphate. It's, a, it's a, an, an appropriation of a, of a religious term. And to destroy the state of Israel. Um, and it's inspired by a post-war European fascism. Um, and it's superimposed upon the religion of Islam. And one thing that Islamism, i.e., as, as defined as the desire to impose one interpretation of uh, religion over society, whether by law or by mm. violence, uh, uh, one thing that it did succeed in doing, unlike Arab socialism before it, was playing on the religious emotions of the Muslim peoples. You say some tough things about that organisation. You were pretty senior in it. You were out recruiting for it um, in Europe and then in Pakistan. And you were finally caught in Egypt and thrown into jail in pretty horrible circumstances. And it was in jail that you started to distinguish more clearly between Islamism and Islam. Yes, I joined the group at 16 after everything we've just discussed in terms of racism or what have you. And and by the age of 24, I'd founded the group in four countries, uh, being on the leadership in Britain, in Egypt, in Pakistan and in Denmark. Um, so everything I did, including recruit army officers from the Pakistani army to instigate a military coup against the regime there, they were arrested in 2003 by Musharraf. Everything I did, I did before the age of 24. So point one is how young, angry teenager, uh, teenagers are exploited by these, uh, by these movements. But yes, I was eventually uh, imprisoned in Egypt. Um, as a political prisoner. And what happened to me there was, first of all, Amnesty International adopted me as a prisoner of conscience. Um, and the work that Amnesty did, particularly through one man, John Cornwall, who, mm. who, who, who wrote and wrote, who, who wrote, and wrote and wrote, yeah. That opened up my heart. And one of the chapters in my book I've called is Where the, the Heart Leads, the Mind Can Follow. Uh, because before somebody can change their mind in terms of their political views, first of all, they have to be willing to consider change. And that requires a process of rehumanization. And with Amnesty's work, uh, I began looking at people again as mm. human beings rather than from a them and us prism. And since then, um, you've campaigned against extremes extremism against Islamism. You've got the Quillam Foundation and, well, and we, other groups. Yes, yeah, so um, myself and another British author, Ed Hussein, we co-founded Quilliam, um, and the basic purpose was to uh, to distinguish Islam, the faith, the religion, which everyone has the right to practice and believe in. I'm a Muslim myself. Uh, to distinguish that from Islamism, the desire to impose one interpretation mm. of Islam over society. We also wanted to protect Islam from those on the far right who, who again, don't make that distinction, like the Islamists, and blame Islam for all the troubles of, of terrorism. So we needed to protect Islam from both extremes. Uh, then we went on to uh, uh, co-found a movement on the grassroots in Pakistan called Khudi, which is a grassroots movement to advocate for the democratic culture among young Pakistanis and, and in that way try and inoculate them against extremist messages uh, that are being pushed in Pakistan. Turning to the theme of Britishness, um, I mean, there's a lot to, to analyse there or drill down into, but um, what do you make of the, um, the current uh, huge concern about people being brought in through arranged marriages and then living most of their lives in subgroups inside the, this country not speaking English, not being not being able to communicate with the majority culture. One of the um, subjects I've tackled in my book is this, and that's the way in which um, communities that are victimised, I mean, I was victimised as, as I was growing up, and communities that are victimised sometimes respond in a way, which is understandable but incorrect. They respond with a siege mentality. They respond by isolating themselves even further. And Islamism did that same thing to Muslim communities in Britain. So we find that minorities' uh, communities self-segregate. And that type of self-segregation isn't helpful. And the first victims are the communities themselves, the minority communities, because it hinders social mobility, it hinders aspirational sort of, you know, achievement-aimed uh, vision for, for progress. And and self-segregation, uh, sort of the first thing that a community has to shed is this victimhood mentality, because without that, with that victimhood mentality there, we find that people are, are, are mm. unable to see that they can break through uh, what the glass ceilings or the sort of the limits on their aspirations that have been placed by society over them. Bob Cheshire, in your, in your book, when you first came back from Washington and looked at the condition of Britain uh, in the mid-'80s, um, you write about um, the racism and what was going on in the streets at, at roughly the same time that Majid was, was experiencing it. Um, do you see much change in the country since then? In, uh, no. in that particular area, I mean. Oh, well, I think, I think there has been. I think the police, I've, uh, uh, of, about whom I've also written a book, uh, have also changed to some extent. I mean, back, back then they had very little concern at all in defending brown and Asian communities and a lot of the, the problems I encountered were not just racist but it was the lack of protection for uh, mm. people of Asian origin in, in the east end of London and it was very very horrible I mean it, I, as soon as I read the south end bit of 
of mm. Madhya's book, I identified with what I had experienced and seen and reported at that time. And I knew that if I had been brown and young then, I would have been radicalised without any question at all and might well have gone in the same, same direction. Uh, I hope and think things are better now. Uh, we've more familiarity with multiculturalism with people, but I agree entirely with what been said about small pockets which I've come across in places like Oldham of communities that never ever get outside their own environment and that is very dangerous to have sort of subgroups who are n never going to latch on to the mainstream. Majid do you think that things have improved overall I mean there's there's, there's been all the problems after 7-7 seven and, seven and, and, and fear of, of Islamist terrorism and so on but do you think that the mood generally is is easier than it was when you were growing up? Things have changed and the way in which they've changed is that no longer do we have policemen riding around also in white vans shouting mm. up Paki when they see us on the streets. That's what used to happen to us. Uh, I was falsely arrested at gunpoint mm. at 15 for suspicion of armed robbery because I was playing with a toy pistol mm. as a 15-year-old child. So things have changed, but, but, but there's a different type of menace out there now, which is what I call the, the, the extremisms in the plural. And that's both Islamist extremism on the one hand and far-right extremism on the other, or anti-Islam extremism. And those two polarised views of... Measuring of, up like two sets of gangs and almost symbiotic they yeah. mutually reinforce each other Brevik in his in his sort of diaries actually spoke in praise of the jihadis and what they've achieved um, they actually admire each other's tactics and and mm. actually have a, a perverse shared agenda and that's the new form of intolerance that we have to deal with it's no longer so much about skin color but about ideas Sikh members in the minority are joining the EDL uh, in an alliance against Muslims so I think it's more about ideas these days and that's because of globalization Christopher May uh, one thing I want to ask, uh, Majid, because uh, I, I sort of experienced this for a number of years, is when you describe uh, Islamism as a political ideology dressed up as Islam, you could almost describe the Christian evangelists in the United States as a political ideology dressed up as Christianity. And to what extent does Islamism, is Islamism, not simply a reaction to uh, um, events in, in Europe, but actually to a very aggressive Western pro-democracy Movement, which is in the United States strongly fueled by uh, Christian evangelism, are you? If Christian evangelism were to diminish, would Islamism diminish? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Islamism um, emerged essentially as a um, as a resistance movement against what they saw as colonialism. The irony is that it's pretty much borrowed European ideology. Um, but they, they, you know, I often say Islamism is the bastard child of colonialism, and they hate me for saying it. But it's it's true. They borrowed uh, much of these ideas, and it is they they define themselves in juxtaposition to other phenomena, such as what you've described with the, the rise of the Christian right in in Europe. But I think it's it's difficult to say sort of it's chicken and egg to say which one came first, because of course the first Islamist or Organization was founded in 1928 in Egypt. Hassan al-Banda founded the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And it was more in response to what he saw as British colonialism. And even the desire to merge um, mosque and state is in fact uh, it's, it's the mirror image of mm -hmm. the Reformation and the separation of church and state. Muslims never had a clergy prior to Islamism. And Islamism is an attempt to create a clergy um, where, where Europe sort of separated the church from the state. So it's, it's this perverse bond with Europe that Islamists have when they're trying to run away from the very thing that they're replicating in, in its mirror image in their own societies. Well, bonds perverse or not with Europe are also one of the themes, of course, um, in the Robert Cheshire book, which I was talking about now. Now, Richard, I should say, as when the Iron Lady ruled Britain, but first written, Bob, 25 years ago, um, and you come back from Washington... And you were kind of looking again at the sort of uh, at the country you'd left behind before and sort of trying to work out what was going on. It seems to me that it was there was an element of J.B. Priestley in what you were doing. He, made, he wrote that wonderful English journey in 1934 or so, went round the country sort of interviewing 19, people. 1933. I did, actually, I did actually carry that with me. I was a great, great fan of the way he, way he wrote and I'm an influence and I do, do cite him from time to time. Some people say, well, you're only away four years. I mean, compared to Christopher or com compared to, to Majid, I wasn't abroad all that long. But on the other hand, if you grow up alongside somebody, you don't notice their change. You, they get marginally greyer by the month or week, and, but they remain in your own eyes the same person. Even four years was enough to come back and take stock and think, goodness, this has changed. And I, I had been in Washington a bit previously, so I was out of the country on and off for six years. And it just struck me that things that had clearly been happening up until the point I left had had consolidated and happened in a very big way while I'd been away. And we changed from the post-war, I suppose, rather soft way of going about things. We were going to get more tolerant. We were, we were going to get richer. 
uh, we could go our easy way. I think this is possibly where Liz would 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 agree with me, and, uh, mm. and there's a lot I would disagree with her about. But we'd kind of drifted, and then suddenly, along had come Mrs. Thatcher, taking us all by the scruff of the neck, and shaken us. And my contention is that she shook us to our overall detriment, in that we emerged a, a less sympathetic, a less careful of each other society. That it was it was. Uh, uh, a less pleasant place to live than it had been when I was when I was a growing harsh, up. A it was a harsher place. And the the people were no longer wanted, like for example, the miners. The miners' strike had happened while I was away, and people like that were no longer wanted. There was no kind of compassion towards them. That was kind of they were surplus and get rid of them. Mm. And and a lot of our problems today, in terms of underclass and people who are not attached to the education system and so on, grow out of that abandonment of people who had been absolutely crucial and who had made, I mean, as Priestley said, had made the, the empire, they'd made the ships, they'd made the steel, they'd dug the coal, and then suddenly they were no longer, they were surplus requirements, and out they went, and I felt that very strongly. And there are clearly parts of the country that if you went back to them now would feel different, um, where there's been lots of new building and a bit of regeneration. The rawness of the immediate aftermath of the miners' strike has passed. These are very different places, for better or worse, now. But there are areas where the similarities are uncanny. I mean, you talk about the city, for instance, and the banking culture, and that first loads of money, um, big money um, culture, which must be partly what's unwinding and what we're suffering the consequences of right now. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, the reason why the book has been republished is very largely because the similarities between then and now. I mean, obviously, as the author, I'd like the book to stay in print all the time, so I had another motivation to get it back into, into the public <laughs> domain. But uh, when I took it to a young publisher, a uh, very young publisher, I mean, uh, younger than anyone around this table, he was uh, gobsmacked, literally, by the similarities between then and now, and he'd grown up as a child under Thatcher and obviously hadn't been able to appreciate the politics of the time because he was too young to do so. And when mm. he suddenly saw so much that was the same, and by complete luck, I suppose, in terms of my timing, Big Bang had just mm. happened, and that had released people to make huge sums of money. And it happened very quickly. I mean, the sort of Bollinger culture that we're now worried about uh, again at this moment took off almost instant big bang happened and so i was i was sort of into a gambling city i mean uh, that kind of way of making money had trans transplanted so, the, the, the past so if in so many ways not that much has changed since this period of uh, thatcherism that you're describing then presumably one of the main guilty parties must be this Labour governments in the intervening periods, I think, uh, from I, your point yeah, of view? Yeah, I, I think all politicians are. I mean, I, one, of the, one of the problems with uh, modern politics is the 24-hour news uh, mm. environment in which we're, we're all engaged to some extent who are in, in journalism. And that has meant that politicians have instant worries about what's happened yesterday, the headline tomorrow. I mean, the Alistair Campbell kind of approach to, to politics, uh, refuting yesterday's mm. headline and making sure tomorrow's is a better one and so on. That left politicians of both parties no time, and Blair was as guilty as Cameron. Cameron's probably in short trousers when I wrote this book, uh, looking back and saying, well, is there anything to learn then? I mean, they, they literally haven't the time doing this firefighting the whole time. No perspective. There's trust. Well, I think um, one of the very interesting things about Bob's book is the fact that he comes from the US when he comes and looks at the UK. And actually what you talk about is the enterprise culture in the UK, in the US, and the fact that people are prepared to set up businesses, they have the American dream, they believe they can achieve things. And one of the problems in Britain is the poverty of aspiration. And I think that's been an endemic problem for quite a long time. I don't think it can be attributed to a particular government, whether that's Labour or Conservative. And I think over the post-war years, we failed to take the difficult decisions we needed to as a country. So why were we in the position of closing down mines in the 80s? It's the fact that those mines had been uneconomic for quite some time and those people mm -hmm. hadn't been retrained and our education system hadn't been sorted out. I mean, I was at a comprehensive in Leeds in the 1980s and it had full-throated Thatcherism reached my school. No, it hadn't. Actually, it was quite a liberal, laissez-faire environment where students weren't getting the kind of education that they needed to succeed in the world. And you had to have a lot of personal mm. motivation if you were to overcome that. So 
I would say there wasn't radical enough change to British society early enough on, and we're still suffering that legacy. You know, the fact that we're, we've got twice as many people with only basic skills as a country like Germany. But I, I would say that we've always, and the legacy goes back a lot further, I quote in the book Victorian politicians who actually got up in the House of Commons and said we must ration education because it is dangerous if the people whose role yeah. in life is to, to dig ditches are too well educated because they'll get, uh, they'll get dissatisfied with their situation. And and cause trouble. And we've never broken up. I mean, this country, fortunately, has never had a revolution, has never had a successful invasion by a foreign power. But that does mean that we've never been shaken to our fundamental roots. And mm. so we've evolved very slowly. And a lot of these problems come out of the the hierarchical nature of our society and that people, and you said the poverty of their, their aspirations, the Ernest Behman called it the poverty of their desires. I mean, we've always suffered from a lack of... Uh, and ambition. I think it's not just at you know, the low-income end of society. If you go, I went to Cambridge University recently and met some recent graduates who said, I said, what are you going to do? They said, well, I'm going to go into banking or management consultancy, every single <laughs> one of them. So there's well-trodden paths for a lot of people in society and a uh, a lack of realisation, I think, of what's going on in the rest of the world. And the, the problem we face now is we've got some very energetic rising nations. And uh, Christopher's programme about Mumbai, I think, shows the level of energy and aspiration in some of those countries. And we simply can't go on with the with the level of education we're achieving at but the moment. I, I make one, one quick point there is that, uh, yes, the, the engine GDP is rising by 7.5% a year, whatever it was Christopher had in his programme. However, if you went to the most Indians out of the many hundred millions there are, they would prefer to live in England than they would in India still, and will do for a very long time. There, there are sort of characters in your book, Bob, who kind of fight a prick, kick against the pricks and, and, and try, to, try to build... Uh, Business. There's a wonderful guy called Brian Bottomley uh, who appears, who's who's um, uh, determined to rescue his factory, and he has his ups and downs and all the rest. D do you happen to know what happened to any of these people? Well, afterwards? I, sta I stayed in touch. Sadly, Brian died about two years ago. Mm. We, we we stayed in touch very much. So, and Christmas card and so on. He finally gave up. I mean, that, the third factory was shot from under him. If factories can be shot from under you, and he said that was that was it. And he went off with whatever he rescued from the from wreckage to live in the south of France where he died a couple of years ago, but we very much did stay in touch. Mm. I, I wanted to trace track down, and I went back to Wakefield, one of the places I went to, and um, there were small businesses, and I went around these back streets where these people had been trying to start things, and they, they'd vanished to, to my... So I couldn't find many of the people. Christopher Mann. I, I wonder whether there's something else in this, uh, uh, Bob, as well, because you seem to have in the book a kind of nostalgia for a kind of gentler Britain that emerged from the Second World War, full of social so solidarity and compassion and so on and so forth. Along comes Thatcher's Big Bang, and all this is blown away, and we turn into crude, naked capitalism. Do you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of Germany after reunification, where Eastern Germany is brought into a much more prosperous Western Germany, and the East Germans come along full of resentment towards the more prosperous West Germans, and the West Germans look at the East Germans as freeloaders. And yet, I went to several sort of dinners and meetings where the people from East Germany, freed from the tyranny of communism, yet said, we had compassion, we had social solidarity, and it was a kinder, gentler society, and here we are in a naked, capitalist West Germany, and it's all horrid and everybody for themselves. Isn't this just a function of affluence, what we're talking you, about? I don't think you describe the years of my childhood as uh, equivalent to East Germany. And, no, not, and an exact, I, no, not an exact. I don't think Clement Attlee that. actually matched that to Joseph Stalin. They were both in, in power at the same the same time. But I do, I do think there was a... I, I mean, I talk this later with, with Liz when she talks about her own, her own book. Uh, I have a feeling that she's kind of aiming towards us becoming, at best, uh, uh, an Asian tiger, at worst, China. And I would much prefer to live in Scandinavia than I would in either of those countries. And I see no reason why we could not have developed, and still maybe can, develop the kind of social democratic model that is, you know, is less thrusting. We, we pay more of our taxes in Liz welfare, wants to jump the in kind of things Liz doesn't want to talk. If all. you look at Scandinavia... They're doing a lot of these reforms as well because their economic model isn't dealing with the 
the the rising economies, say for example Sweden, has got rid of national pay bargaining and moved to individual contracts. I think countries like Canada and Germany are good examples of reform that can take place. Canada reducing its deficit, Germany reforming its education system. I mean, according to international studies, we were be, we were ahead of Germany ten years ago in our education results. We're now behind them. So I think there are Western countries who've managed to adapt whilst not sort of throwing the baby out with the bar. I'm, I'm always, I'm always yes, deeply sorry. suspicious of those kind of studies, and, <laughs> and uh, I suspect we've been behind the Germans for much longer. I just than wanted that. to pick up on the, um, on the population point, actually, what, that, that, um, that Liz, you mentioned, that at the end of the day, we do have a younger population here than, than most of Europe that you've referred to, and that is comparable in that sense to India and those countries. Mm-hmm. And I do believe, and I, I, I would endorse the idea, that we're not exploiting that young population enough. And there, there needs to be a way, I think, of, of merging the two points, that you're obviously also con- concerned about what you called the underclass in British society. And that's the same underclass that also happens to be young that you're concerned about. Mm-hmm. And, and perhaps we should all focus on how to best exploit the talents of these young people. Comparisons with Europe in that sense wouldn't necessarily hold up because they do have a much older population. I'd, mm-hmm. I'd like to ask uh, both of the, the authors looking at the sort of Britannia uh, question directly, um, whether you think there is a democracy problem, which is that by and large politicians looking to be elected every four or five years, don't like giving people bad news and don't like saying to people, you're all going to have to work harder, the schools are going to have to be tougher, you know. In other words, there is a a sort of a gentleness um, built into democracy which um, can put off the hard decisions. I don't know about gentleness, it's a kind of... Of ambition driven by by populism, and I, I find that I find it dangerous. Or a wetness, on the other, on the other hand, I, w- yeah. I would go back to Winston Churchill and say, of all the forms of government, yeah, sure. democracy is probably the best. But there clear, the clearly is that problem, and the, and I think the media hasn't helped the pandering to the populist desires at the bottom. And I think the House of Commons has let us down quite badly in this respect, that they haven't defended, they haven't been representative in the way they perhaps were. I mean, when, for example, capital punishment was abolished, I suspect now if capital punishment was still on the books, people look at Daily Mail polls and say, we better keep it because the people want it. There, there, there is a yeah. tremendous problem with that kind of democracy. I think there's an element of courage and leadership required, as Bob says. Mm. But also, if we, if we do look at Germany, which did perform badly in the PISA League tables in 2000. There was a national outcry about it. PISA shock was on the front page of the German newspapers. They had a, P- PISA, PISA is the international is the, ranking of, it's of the international educational ranking. standards. It's done by the OECD. <coughs> it's an international <coughs> ranking where 15-year-olds sit a standardised test. And when the Germans did badly in this, there was a national outcry. They had a TV quiz show called The PISA Show. People were talking about it in the bars and restaurants of Berlin, this was a major issue. Yet when we have done comparatively badly in 2009, there is not a murmur. So I think it's a broader cultural issue than just politics. It's about what do we think is important? And it seems to me that quite often we'd rather have a row about who's done the wrong thing or who's to blame than say, let's look at ourselves properly. Are we working hard enough? Are we trying hard enough to compete? So when you call your book, which is coming out in September, Britannia Unchained, and and you call yourselves the, 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 the new radicals in the Conservative Party, you're looking for um, a, y- your agenda is about uh, pushing the state back a bit, cutting taxes, cutting regulation, allowing people to m- make money more easily. Uh, there's a, I'm, there's I'm, an element of that, but I think you know what what we're saying. If you look at something like the city, that has been successful partly because the state has underwritten uh, the city's debt. So. That, in my view, isn't necessarily real capitalism of the sort that Bob's talking about in the US, where people are setting up their own enterprises. What we're saying is that Britain needs to be more optimistic about where we are. We need to take advantage of the fact that we've got a young population. We need to think like a young country. And that is things like radically overhauling our education system, working harder. Um, the number of working hours in Britain has gone down. We're 11 percent less productive than the G7 average. I mean, my view, and I would agree with Bob on this, is that the education system and the way we educate people is the key to our future success. And that if you look at the cognitive skills and the growth of countries, they're very heavily correlated. And we we have a skills problem compared to our international competitors. So I think that's the main area where we can make real change. Imagine. Yeah, I think this idea of us being a young country is, is crucial to explore because 
Britain is traditionally conservative with a small C. And I think that um, we're not really... We, we become so risk averse. We're not really interested in innovating mm. or exploring yeah. new territory. When it comes to the the, I mean, the rest of the world and and its population are are steaming ahead in innovations and are developing expertise in very specific areas and then are exporting those expertise across the world. And I don't believe that we have that same. Sorry, we're not encouraging that same spirit with the young people in the UK. And though it is at, at the end of the day the future, um, and we have become comfortable with the idea of Little England and everything being about sort of how we do things in the UK, but we need to start getting with the times and really start exploiting some of the opportunities that globalisation has presented to us. Rob? Well, I, 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 I think there should be a middle way between, we appear to only have two alternatives at the moment. One, we become a kind of, we, we all get up at five in the morning, we go to bed at midnight and we, we work like, like mad and we, we live rather restricted lives as a consequence of that, or we go bankrupt. Well, somewhere in between, I mean, if you go back to what's happening in, in Europe, I feel terribly sorry for people like Greek olive growers and Greek fishermen who, you know, pottering about doing their business, living according to their own lights, earning as much as they want, and then suddenly the whole situation changes, the currency collapses, nobody wants their products because it, it's no longer economic and so on. We're, we're, we're turning upside down ways of life, including in this country, that uh, are fundamental to... A, a decent and civilised existence. Chris Mann. Well, one of the things that interested us when we were making this television series was how typical of the United Kingdom is London. Is London a city-state mm. which is divorced from the rest of the nation? And it's a general theme which we explored throughout the series because the messages that came out from all kinds of people we spoke to, particularly foreigners, was that if you're looking for a young city in the world, look to London. Mm. And that is, you know, that is at the heart of what you're saying, Liz. It's uh, the, yeah. the the really big enemy is declinism, exactly, or pessimism. exactly. And there are pockets of great effort and great uh, work ethic in Britain, and there are pockets of excellence. So, for example, our universities are in the top two and three in the world. So mm. we we do have areas of great expertise, but. Unfortunately, we are not educating the broad mass of British people to the extent we should. And also, there's a group of people in Britain, and I would highlight a comment made by Emma Duncan in The Economist, where she said, we can afford to slip a few places down the World League tables if the next generation get to have a lie-in. And that is, I think, an attitude that's quite endemic, that we can afford a bit of decline, that we should be a bit more comfortable. I don't think that's a realistic option. I think we could end up in the position of the Greek uh, olive growers if we think that way well let's because you you want a more of an internationalist perspective and on cue sir christopher mayor has been giving us an or will be giving us an internationalist perspective because you've been around six cities in the world looking at um in this case elites power elites the people who actually run things and it seems that city after city after city paints similar pictures. One of your points is that, is that they really are different and you can't, you can't make one rule for, for all elites, except that networks, cliques, who knows who, cosy little clubs, family connections, all these things matter more than textbooks tell us they should do. Yeah, that's, tr that, that's true. But, I mean, I think we stretch quite to quite a significant degree the concept of the elite. Um, so... One says elite and one thinks of uh, men with big cigars sitting in um, mm. smoke-filled rooms and things like that. But if you're looking for people who make cities tick, uh, looking for individuals and institutions, one of the places you go to, for example, is uh, the president of the Federation of New York Taxi Drivers, who has such a grip on the transport system of New York City that he gets invited to ball games of the governor of New York State and goes and has dinner with uh, Mayor Bloomberg... Um, of New York City. And strangely enough, in Mumbai, that is not a programme all about Mumbai billionaires, although one or two do, do come into it. Again, we find ourselves talking to trade union leaders who are running public transport systems who are by any definition of power in an elite. Um, so it's not just politicians at the top of the tree. It's not just billionaires at the top of the money tree. Um, it is people who control the sinews of a city without which it cannot function. And so you have to paint a very, very broad, uh, on a very broad canvas here. And do you come away thinking that the definition of a, a, an optimistic and successful city is one where the power networks are sufficiently disparate and diffused, where there isn't a single overwhelming source of power, as there very much seems to be, for instance, in Moscow? Well, it, 
disparate power centres are, I think, one criterion. Another criterion is it doesn't matter how many power centres you've got, how many ladders are there up leading into them. So in other words, you have to decide whether the power elites are closed to newcomers or whether they refresh themselves regularly. Mm. You mentioned Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a city where uh, power is incredibly disparate. Um, but you would not say that this is organised into a, a mm. coherent whole. So let's turn to London, which is um, our particular source of interest this morning. Um, I mean, it, it has been argued, uh, frequently is argued, that actually Britain is pretty closed still, that you've got all these old Etonians running um, the Cabinet, um, old Etonian running London. Um, it's still a small number, of, surprisingly small number of people in the city who will know each other, and that's the problem. I suspect you would say all of that is wrong. Well, well, actually, London is a much more open city. It is we? a much more open city. All of those things exist. Well, they exist, obviously. Yeah. They, you, can, true. you can find the legacy everywhere, from livery companies to gentlemen's clubs to closed city institutions. But there seems to be a mass of creativity out there, which it goes way beyond the traditional tourist view, if you like, heritage view um, of London. And some of the most interesting conversations we had were with foreigners who can observe perhaps more objectively how what beat this city marches to. For example, I, we went down to the Whitechapel Road and had a very interesting conversation with one of the leaders of the Somali community, a community, incidentally, which I didn't know, has been here for a couple of hundred years. And for them, London was the land of opportunity, a place where they could rise up the ladder, whichever one they chose mm. to take, and they knew that their children and grandchildren would lead better lives than they did. We went to see some Russians, one of whom is, uh, is uh, the owner of, of, of several newspapers, another chap who started up a social media, uh, social networking site. And again, they said, now, we could have come to any city in the world to make our fortunes and to get on artistically and commercially. But we chose London because you, anyone can succeed here. I was, I was fascinated by that. This trust. I mean, I think that what Christopher is describing is a meritocracy, which is which is what what Britain should be. I think the question is, to what extent is London a reflection of all of Britain? And to what extent are the people we're talking about necessarily from Britain? And I think the country has meritocratic structures, but we we still struggle with this issue of when people are born, do they think this is going to be my destiny? There's yes. a kind of fatalism about parts of the national psyche that I think, the rest I think we need to turn more to what Christopher's well, talking can about. I, can, I, can, I, can I offer, can I offer Liz, <laughs> Liz, Liz, some, Liz some, uh, some hope in her, her rather so <coughs> gloomy view of, view of things? We went to a, a Hindu wedding in Mumbai, full of flash and spark. The bride and groom arrive in a white coach drawn by white horses with outriders in uniform on also on white steeds and they come in to the sound of loud music and guess what that music is in this entrepreneurial family who are uniting themselves between their their their, their, their son and daughter it is rule britannia rule uh. britannia is the chosen <laughs> music for an an entrepreneurial, but driving Chris, Mumbai did you, family. Did you ask them if they realised what it actually was? Or simply <laughs> thinking they like the tune? Bob, I was not going to insult their intelligence by asking that question. <laughs> but the, 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 I mean, what we are essentially saying in our book is that Britain needs to look at our roots as a commercial trading nation, an entrepreneurial nation, which has been adopted by so many other countries in the, in the world. But doesn't, doesn't that pose some, some difficult questions about identity and change as well. We, you know, we started off talking uh, about racism in Essex and we end up saying that the key to London's success is its openness to the rest of the world. And, it's, and indeed, you were talking again about the young country. A lot of the reason that we've got that kind of demographic is, you know, immigrant communities into this country. Mm. But if London is happy being a world city, the question is, is Britain happy being a world island? Rather less so. But see, on this point, I think we're in danger of missing something here, that though these communities that you refer to, the Somalis in East London, for example, do have their power structures and their success stories, um, as you've just said, Andrew, if we look towards Britain as, a, as on a macro level, what we find increasingly, and I'm worried about, is that these communities are still living together apart. And so uh, those Somali communities in Whitechapel, how many of those young Somalis born and raised there, or indeed the young Bangladeshis born and raised mm. there, are growing up with other than Bangladeshi or Somali friends or are growing up interacting with people that they ostensibly define as the other. Many of them have Bangla as their first language or Somali as their first language. And we find that they're using London um, 
and good 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 on them for doing so but uh, it's not you know overall it's not a good story that they're using london to to progress as a community and linking to somalia or bangladesh respectively but how much national unity is there in the uk and how much of london is representative of say for example up north or beyond mm. the m25 christopher May. well it's an excellent question and what may be valid in london may be completely invalid elsewhere in the united kingdom and i think that's one of the interesting questions all i can say to you on the basis of a fairly long conversation with a group of Somalis, including there, one of them had his little son there, who was as Lon- as a, as much a Londoner as any kid in London I have ever met. And we had endless conversation, for example, about London football teams and who who with whom was their allegiance. And there was no sense, if I can put it like this, of a closed community seeking to better itself so that one day it could return. Uh, to its homeland. I really did get the feeling these were integrated Londoners with a long London tradition and who, whose aspirations were in the city. Objection. Well, I, I, we rather brushed over the, 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 uh, the fact that uh, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, is an old Etonian. My MP is an old Etonian and I, I sincerely think that we're not going to modernise our country unless we do something about private education. It is a very, very small tail attached to a very, very large dog. 7% and it, and it, of the... Yes, 7% yeah. of the population only go to fee-paying schools. And it, and it wags that, that well, dog. And it commands, increasingly since unions and things have been got rid of, it commands the, com- the heights in a way that it didn't do even when I was... But was I, I think a lot course. of that was to do with what happened to education in the 60s and 70s and so-called progressive education, which made the gap much worse between rich and poor. I mean, it seems to be crazy to blame the 7% of schools which are churning out good results and say, well, the 93% are... You, you need to fix the 7% rather than 93%. I mean, I I went to a comprehensive in the, in the 1980s. There was a lot that that school could have done with those resources mm. to make the education for students better. There and that's a- what we need to look at, not blaming... There is a small proportion. Can I say there is? Old, an, no, no, sorry, I think, sorry, we're, I think we're out of time. I was going to say there is an absolute BBC rule that all discussions on Britishness end up talking about grammar schools, and we very nearly got there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to all my guests. Majid Nawaz's radical: my journey from Islamist extremism to a democratic awakening is out now. Robert Cheshire's when the Iron Lady ruled Britain has just been reissued out now too. Britannia Unchained, co-authored by Elizabeth Truss, is out in September. And you can see Sir Christopher Mayer's television series, Networks of Power, beginning on Sky Atlantic next Tuesday night at nine o'clock. And that is it from start the week until the autumn. We're back on Monday, the 17th of September. Next week, you can enjoy The Long View. But for now, goodbye. Islamists jailed in Egypt and now campaigns against extremism. has a very different perspective, I suspect, on what Britishness means or should mean today. Majid, let's start um, with a little bit of biography. You, you, you open your book, Radical, um, with a pretty terrifying account of what it was like to be um, a relatively rare brown face in your part of Essex. Indeed. Of, of course, in those days, um, uh, people that were following uh, the, the situation with racism would be aware uh, that we experienced white flight. People that fled from East London to get away with Im- <clears throat> from immigration came to Essex. And, of course, they found me there. Um, so so uh, one of the ways I describe racism in my book is to say that it's difficult to understand when you look at people, Mm -hmm. you don't see your own skin colour, you see the face uh, ahead of you Uh, but racists will uh, forever see you as a moving target because of course you can't shed the colour of your skin Uh, so we'd be walking around randomly in the streets of Essex and without warning uh, would be surprise attacked by groups of uh, burly men in their 20s, I would be 15 13, 14 years old at the time and they would jump out of the back of white vans uh, with uh, big knives, hammers and screwdrivers and literally just plough into us mm. uh, without warning. A global organisation founded in 53 in Jerusalem and their, and their basic purpose is, as they state, to overthrow every single Arab and Muslim majority regime uh, to replace them with one global super state that they call a caliphate it's, a, it's a, an, a, an appropriation of a, of a religious term, and to destroy the state of Israel. Um, and it's inspired by uh, post-war European fascism 
um, and it's superimposed upon the religion of Islam. And one thing that Islamism, i.e., as, as defined as the desire to impose one interpretation of uh, religion over society, whether by law or by mm. violence, uh, uh, one thing that it did succeed in doing, unlike Arab socialism before it, was playing on the religious emotions of the Muslim peoples. You say some tough things about that organisation. You were pretty senior in it. You were out recruiting for it um, in Europe and then in Pakistan. And you were finally caught in Egypt and thrown into jail in pretty horrible circumstances. And it was in jail that you started to distinguish more clearly between Islamism and Islam. Yes, I joined the group at 16, after everything we've just discussed in terms of racism or what have you. And and by the age of 24, I'd founded the group in four countries, uh, being on the leadership in Britain, in Egypt, in Pakistan, and in De- Identity 3 Music. So why did you move from that to Islamism, which is the next phase of the story? Right, so... Of course, Bosnia was unfolding before our eyes in Europe. And there in Bosnia, um, I saw white, blonde hair, blue-eyed Muslims who were being targeted uh, because of their, apparently because of their faith. Up until Bosnia, I'd associated all of my troubles with racism. Uh, but then, of course, I had to rethink when I saw what was happening. I wish you explain, you were from a Muslim family, your father pretty religiously conservative, small c, your mother more liberal, so you'd seen yeah. both sides. Yeah, conservative in a traditional Pakistani way, which was pluralistic, but nevertheless with conservative family values, whereas my mother was, as you said, liberal. Um, and when we saw what happened in Bosnia, we were forced to rethink and, and ask the questions, is this just a race issue or is it something deeper? Is there an issue with Islam itself? Now, of course, into that scene jumped groups, Islamist groups, who had deliberately politicised the religion. And as hip-hop became an identity tag um, for these groups, the religion became something of a political revolution and a new identity. And, and recruiters came along and exploited our grievances, exploited the fact that we did have real problems and, and managed to recruit us and, and, and bring in this group, Hibs Tahrir. Hibs Tahrir is an organization, it's a, and so uh, on many occasions, as a teenager, I had to watch many of my friends stabbed before my eyes, and on one occasion, one of my white friends, because he was deemed a blood traitor for having associated mm. with me. Stepped in between you. He did, he did. I say terrible. friend, I mean, I've never uh, met him yeah. since, and I've never met him before. In fact, he was, so he was walking past, he decided to try and defend me, um, and, uh, and he was stabbed as a result, and I was forced to watch. And the first um, way that you established a sort of solidarity, a larger group that worked, was through music, really. Indeed. We, we, as a result of feeling disenfranchised and disconnected from society, we uh, we fled towards a subculture. Hip-hop was... Uh, was was growing. It was new. It was exciting. Uh, we became what we called b-boys. Uh, we wa- we dressed in a certain way. We walked even in a certain way. Mm. We got into graffiti and dance, uh, break break dancing, um, and MCing live on stage. And it was the early heydays of hip hop when when the messages were very political as well. Uh, groups like Public Enemy that 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 released an album called Fight the Power. Um, and hip hop was uh, it, though nowadays we look at it as gangster rap and all about sort of women and drugs. In those days, it was more about. Well, I suppose it still is, but especially in those days, it was more about identity and finding our... Thank you for downloading the Start the Week podcast from BBC Radio 4. For more information, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4. Hello. Well, this is the last Start the Week before we break for the summer. During the series, we've talked about British conservatism and socialism, about British history and landscape... And now, with what's supposed to be a celebratory summer underway, we're concluding by trying to take the temperature of this feverish nation. Robert Cheshire returned 25 years ago from Washington, where he was the Observer's Man, and wrote an account of what he found in Margaret Thatcher's Britain, Return of the Native Reporter. Now he has revisited it and asked how much we've changed since then. Well, not nearly enough, Elizabeth Truss, the Conservative MP, would probably say. She's one of a group of Tory MPs taking on the idea of inevitable decline in a book, Britannia Unchained. Sir Christopher Mayer, formerly our man in Washington, has made a television series looking at networks of power around the world, lots of different cities, including in London. And Majid Nawaz brought up fleeing racist thugs in Essex, spent many years as an Islamist.